I'm Holly O'Neill, President of Retail Banking at Bank of America, and I'm thrilled to be at The Star with a truly fabulous guest. Since joining the family business in 1989, after her legendary father purchased this empire, my guest has taken it from a struggling franchise to a $9 billion winner. And as the Executive Vice President and Chief Brand Officer of the Dallas Cowboys, Charlotte Jones is the mastermind behind some of the Cowboys' most iconic brand deals. And she's made it her mission to keep new and longtime fans surprised, delighted, and engaged. Charlotte is a trailblazer for women in sports. She's a mother, daughter, sister, and she has fantastic taste in shoes, today rocking her custom Dallas Cowboys boots. Charlotte Jones, thank you for being here. Holly, I'm so excited that you are here at the Star. It's great to be here. Yes. Uh, the energy is unbelievable, so it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank yes. you for having so me. So I have some questions okay. for you. Um, you were in politics before you got to the helm of the most valuable football franchise in the world. So tell us about that pivot. How did you make that pivot and what was it like? So, well, you know, being in, in Washington, um, you know, that's that's quite a, a place of controversy um, itself. And um, this whole family effort was, was definitely a controversial one. Um, my father came to visit myself and my brother, who was at Georgetown at the time, and said, you know, I've got this harebrained idea. I want to buy the Dallas Cowboys. And, you know, for us sitting there in Washington country, you know, it was one of those, you want to do what? And, you know, you just, he, he kind of laid everything out for us and it was really not a good financial situation. As a matter of fact, right. you know, the Cowboys were for sale for a reason. Right. You know, they were losing a lot of money. Everything was really in, in high distress. The team was not successful, hadn't been for a long time. And here my dad, you know, wanted to, to do all of this. And, uh, you know, when you look at some of the has that much passion behind their motivation, right. it's hard to say no. Right. And at the same time, it's like, well, it's your dad. I guess they can do whatever they want to do. So it's really hard to say no. And so, you know, at that time he said, you know, if I do this, this is the only time he's ever said anything to me that I felt like was a true underestimation. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, if we do this, this just may change our life a little. Well, <laughs> well, you know, here we go. <laughs> Change the life a little. Well, on we went. I stayed in Washington for a year. That year, the Cowboys went one and fifteen. We won one game. It happened to be in Washington D.C. Thank goodness. Well, that was a good and winner. That was a good winner. You know, at least she could walk That's down right. the hall that 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 Monday. Um, and while I was there, I you know I got this random call from my dad and and. When he was back in Dallas, you know, everything was on fire. He had fired Coach Landry, so everything was negative. He was from Arkansas, going to Texas. That was negative. So it was just this inferno of controversy. And he calls me and he said, Charlotte, do you know the difference between hot pants and biker shorts? <laughs> And yeah, that's about what I did. I'm like, uh, um, did you have a football team to coach? Or like, what are you doing? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, you know, there are a line of women outside of my office that think I'm going to change this cheerleader uniform. I don't even know where their studio is. I don't know anything about this. I don't know why this is happening. Will you just come down here and figure this out? So I left for the weekend and came down to Dallas. Sure enough, it was one of many, many rumors that was actually happening, but they were they were on strike, so it was actually right. a real deal. We got it all resolved, and while I was here, he said, will you stay? And, you know, I looked at him and I, I just said, well, I don't know anything about running a professional sports franchise. And he was dead serious, and he said, that's okay, neither do I. And he said, you know, I just need people around me that I can trust. Right. And in that, you know, I packed up my bags. I moved to Dallas, find myself a little broom closet, made it into an office. And I'm like, I'm here. And off we went on this incredible journey that really, I, you know, it was kind of go down there to put out a fire and then turn around and 30 right. years later, you're still here. That's pretty amazing. So yeah. hot pants and biker shorts, you yes. solved a major problem, a major issue, but that is what so much is about. It's being yeah. able to problem solve. Yeah. And, you know, that takes a whole variety of flavors and shapes and sizes, yeah. I'm sure. Um, so the Cowboys organization is your family business yes. and you guys are literally football royalty. So how did you come in at that time 
and carve out your own individual legacy and what you were going to do amidst your brothers and your father? You know, um, it's really interesting, as many people may know, my father casts a very large shadow. And (laughs) in that shadow is actually where everything really happens. And for me, you know, the family business had historically been oil and gas. So this was not our family business. Um, The NFL doesn't actually hand you a blue book and says, here's how you run an NFL team. Um, It's very different than that. So coming into the football business, per se, uh, alongside my older brother. My younger brother was in law school. Um, You know, you jump in the middle of all of this just trying to figure it out. Right. You know, and I think in that moment, there was so much that was going wrong that, um, you know, the ability to jump in and try to take on one problem while everyone else is addressing another um, gave you a little bit of independence, you know, from from the whole orchestration. Right. But at the same time, um, it, it, because we didn't know anything about how to do anything, my father gave us this incredible permission to fail. And in that, you know, we just tried to figure out how to make it right. work. And, you know, at that time, the team was losing $75,000 a day, over a million dollars a month. And the team was three and thirteen, so every everything was a mess. And it was like, how do you how do you do it? And the the answer was we didn't know. Right. So trying to get in there and find out what things were were significant, where you could actually leave a mark, where you could right. make a change, um, became the journey itself. And I think in that became, okay, this this is where I, I find um, where I do my best work. Right. And I, I think as, as I look back on it, it seems that, you know, crisis was really where I did my, yeah. my best work. It's when right. things were blowing up. Okay, right. how do we go in here and, and fix something? Because, you know, let's face it, what you try is not going to be as bad as what's happening. That's so right. you That's just right. try to Only figure out to how to turn the ship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only up to go. Okay, so speaking of crisis, he yeah. told you two things. Stop the bleeding, but don't tarnish the star. Yeah. So what did that mean to you? And and that had to be a tall order for you. Yeah. You know, at the time, I, I don't know that I actually understood exactly what it meant then. Um, because what I realized over time is the only thing that we actually had bought was something that you actually can't own. Right. You know, and the Dallas Cowboys, it's kind of like owning Notre Dame or, you know, something right. that the fans own, right. it, you know, and you're just here to do your job and to do um, all that you can while you're in the position to actually influence change. And in that, I realized that the true value of, of what we had a hold of was the tradition, right. was the star, what right. it was the affinity right. of what people, you know, right. believed in. And there was so much of it that was so authentic and so important to people. That avidity was real. And in that moment, they were showing their avidity in a, in a very aggressive right. <laughs> way. And so it was like, okay, how do we harness all of that and all of that, that great tradition yeah. and still be able to influence change to make, you know, to just to turn the ship, you know, to make things right. better, to make it financially viable, to make it successful on the field. You know, how, how did we do that? And, and I think over time, the importance of that um, has certainly guided absolutely every decision right. that we've made since then. Right. So you really have been a trailblazer for women in sports, including you're the first chairman of the NFL Foundation. What advice would you give for other women who want to enter male-dominated organizations, industries, because you really have been an incredible trailblazer? Well, thank you for that. But I, I think that, you know, the interesting part of my journey is I don't know that I actually chose that. Right. <laughs> I didn't choose the, the male-dominated, you? Right. you know, industry. I, I actually, I had a love for fashion. I, you know, all these other things that I was thinking that I might be doing with my life. And then it turns out that here, here we were in the middle of right. it. But what I found out that while I was here, um, and I give a lot of credit to, to my father because he had so much confidence in me, more confidence than I ever had in myself. But, but the goal of being completely authentic in, in who you are. Right. In that for us, us, you know, almost 50% of our fans are female. And in that, you know, 
if you don't have a right. female voice right. and you're making decisions, right. you're missing half your That's fan right. base, you know, That's and you're right. you're missing a real true voice. And I having that voice and expressing that at the table, you know, was very important. I'll, I'll never forget. Um, I had my first opportunity. It was the first time that the commissioner had decided at our big annual meetings to let an owner speak in front of the ownership group. So it was all the owners, all the head coach. And usually it came from, you know, it was the NFL talking right. to, you know, the owners. And he asked me to be one of the speakers. So, you know, my dad was all excited about it. I was as nervous as you can imagine. Yes. And I, you know, I kept thinking about, okay, how, how am I going to do this? And I remember getting ready. My room adjoined to my parents at right. the annual meeting. And I came out <laughs> and I was in my suit, had my pants suit <laughs> You're on. You ready to go. Yes. I, you know, I was all ready to go. And my dad looked at me and he goes, why are you wearing pants? And I, I, I it just took me by surprise. I'm like, well, well, because, you know, I'm speaking in front of the owners. He goes, go back to your room and put on that dress that you right. always wear. Right. It's like, go just be yourself. Right. You need to stand up and be yourself, own who you are. And he's asking you to speak because of who you are, not because of who you think right. you're supposed to be. And I, that alone um, was a really pivotal moment for me of, of trying to uh, make sure that I stayed true to who I was, right. not to the expectation of who people thought I was. Right. That's, it's pretty incredible because if you think of the last two decades, being authentic and who you are as a woman really has taken a major turn. And I think yes. it's probably because of women like yourself. Um, and the confidence that your dad showed in Yeah, That's you know, it, it does, incredible. I think it does take confidence. I, I don't yeah. know why we as women like beat ourselves up right. in that because right. I, don't, I don't think, and I can say this because I have two brothers, but they don't have any problem with right. confidence. Oh, so. gosh, no. Nope. <laughs> so it's like, I don't know why we do that to ourselves yeah. and not, you know, just to stand up there and, and can own that. Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, that, that mirror, and my, my parents have always referred to it as that, that mirror is your, your worst enemy. Right. If, you, if you can conquer right. the person in the mirror and and pull out who they are, then right. you will be successful in whatever you do. That's incredible and great yeah. advice. Yeah. So you, you said you thought maybe a career in fashion, mm -hmm. but you were the first woman to design a Super Bowl ring. Yeah. So you put that to work. So tell me a little bit about that. Who doesn't love to design jewelry? Oh my gosh. I mean, what an incredible experience. Yeah. I mean, we had literally had been here for three years and then we went on to win the next three out of four Super Bowls um, and completely turned the organization around to become one of the most valuable in sport. And in that journey of those Super Bowl wins, you know, you get to design a ring. Right. I mean, how how great is that? Fantastic. And I, I will say this, that it was the first time I felt really comfortable in what I was doing. Confident. <laughs> I was very confident. <laughs> this was going to be amazing. And I had one piece of advice from Michael Urban. And he said, make the diamonds look like headlights. <laughs> And did like, you make the diamonds look like headlights? We made the diamonds look like headlights, okay. yes. So you've talked a couple times here in this conversation about the fan base. Mm. So, and you've created such unique fan experiences coming in yesterday here at the Star. I mean, it is like its own world encapsulated with positive mm. energy and entertainment. So talk to me about your focus on the fans and how that's played into the success of the franchise. You know, um, most businesses have shareholders to deliver right. a value to. Um, we have fans to deliver an experience to. And that is always our number one priority. And how do we do that? Because the facts are, is that only 7% of NFL fans, fans ever go into a stadium. 7%. That's staggering. That is like a staggering fact. And when you think about that and you think about all the energy and effort that you put into the stadium and the experience that you right. want to provide there, then you realize, well, you're only getting a small core group of them. Right. So how do you make that experience evergreen and live beyond right. the 10 days that we are there? And that's where the star came into the right. picture. It's we need to deliver an experience 355 days a year beyond our games. And how do we do that? And how do we touch people in a way and bring them that same kind of authentic experience right. um, in a unique way? And we literally are here at the star 
where we live, where we right. work, where we train. Right. And if we can have um, create an atmosphere where we have a chance encounter with a fan and a player at a restaurant or at practice right. or in the hotel, wherever that is, then we really can create, um, you know, a, a very uh, deep in the avidity, really, of our fans to be a part of of us in other settings, not just on game day. And delivering that experience so they get to, you know, be motivated by the same things that we look at right. and see players practicing right. every day and the work that they do that, right. you know, motivates you to work a little harder the next day or to be excited about, you know, what that energy can bring to them, that that's where we need to keep our, our focus. Right. Well, it's pretty incredible. I've been here for 24 hours and that sense of community and the energy certainly has come through. That's so, true. so football fans are probably some of the most loyal fans there are, yes. right? Yes. So, what are you doing to build that brand loyalty even further as you as you look forward you with know, the organization? When we think about that, we think about it at the at the stadium and you know, you realize um, you know, one of our network executives um, who partner with the league and and carry our, our games on TV, he said, you know, um, the biggest competition for the NFL is not really the person, the team that you're playing. Right. It is our best partner our networks of delivering a game on television that makes that lazy boy mm -hmm. more inviting and more affordable right. than maybe an experience that you could come engage right. with um, out at a game or even out here. And and how do, how do we look at that? Uh, because the most important thing, he said, of watching a game on television is wishing you were there. Right. And so if you could take that magic of that, oh, I wish I was there right. in all of that excitement and bring that to life right. in game and then somehow figure out how to take that excitement and get it to the people that aren't in the stadium, right. that that would be where the sweet spot was. So we needed to figure out a way to deliver an experience at the game that you couldn't get anywhere else. Yeah. And give people a way to share that experience of, look, I'm here, you know, I'm here, you're not, or maybe right. I'm here, I wish right. you were here with right. me, you right. know, whatever that right. shared experience might be, and translate that so that they can then share that experience yeah. beyond. And, uh, you know, when we started here, there really was no technology, there was no computer, there was no cell phone, there was none of that. Totally and so your, you know, your focus was yeah truly on you know the stadium experience yeah. and now because we have such great technology right. and we have you know such great digital access that right. we can take all of those experiences and send them out to people so they feel like they're a part of something right. and I, you know i think um, where we try to address every day is that um, you know humanizing those who play the game um, I, I think is really that pe people want to know yeah. what people are like, want to know what makes them tick, want right. to know what why Micah Parsons thinks he's a lion. You know, they, they want to <laughs> they want to know that they want to know like what what is right. inside What's of there? him that gets him to there, right. and how can I take that with me? So, yeah. you know, in that space is where you know we use our our great partners in technology like yeah. AT and T. We partner with AI partners that can bring us an experience like the hologram with Jerry right. downstairs right. and we try to figure out how to maximize that yeah but understand the uniqueness and the preciousness of of that culture that we're right. trying to build right yeah it's great and I mean technology has transformed so many industries yeah. and live sports is no different so what role do you think as you move forward digital will play do you think it will play an e an ever increasing role in the experience for the fans? Yeah, I, I think two things. First, just in, in, in technology, um, we now have in, in the league, we refer to it as a digital athlete. So we actually use the data and the technology from practice and evaluating are the players playing right. at um, you know a maximum capacity? Do we right. need to pull them out of practice? Do we need to monitor you know all right. of these things that we now have that we never used to have? So safety is a number one concern 
and maximizing efficiency, but we can do that now with, with data. Um, also, you know, with technology, the, the thing that is, as you have seen, we started in fantasy football, right? So now people are fans of, yeah. of, of players, not just right. teams, you right. know, that they, they are engaging in right. ways that they, they didn't before. And so every game is important to them, yeah. which is really important for the league. And now you've seen sports betting come in and add to that and add to that deepening of right. the avidity or the connectivity of, of keeping people watching all the way through to the end because that last play is going to affect them whether the game is technically over That's or right. not. So that part is is really interesting. And I think that we will continue, you know, for us, you know, the big picture in the NFL is where are you going to be watching our game? You know, is is that on a linear TV format or is it all going into right. a streaming format? And right. who will our partners be in the future? That's right. So there, there is a lot of all the great that technology has created for us is creating major pivot points for us as well in terms of who our future partners will be. Yeah, that's great. Well, Charlotte, thank you so much for joining me today. Yes. I really appreciate it. I mean, from understanding and learning about how you manage through crisis to being being the trailblazer to how you're driving that fan experience and, and digital transformation is incredibly interesting. So thank you very much. Thank you, Holly. Thank you so much for coming out to the star. This has been a real treat. Oh, and speaking of treats, I have a little special treat oh. for you. Yes. Oh, wow. Come, we love to gift. Okay. So you can't come all the way here without well, getting a little phenomenal. cowboy something. Okay. Oh, you are so, officially oh, wow. a member of the Dallas oh, wow. Cowboys. Look We're at that. Suit you up on a Sunday. I love that. I will be wearing this on Sunday yes. for sure. Number 24. I love this. 2024. I love it. Thank you Welcome so much. Welcome to the team. Oh, thank you. So, team, thanks again for tuning in to Game Changers today. And, Charlotte, thank you again. So fun.